Hi everyone. At this point, I hope that uh, you have your notes out on stars. You should have taken some notes last night for homework. And uh, remember, as you watch this video and uh, here are the notes, you will be adding anything that's in orange or anything that I say that's important. Um, I appreciate your cooperation today. My son is still sick, so I'm, I'm home again today, but I will be back on Monday. Um, if you have any questions, we'll make sure we touch on everything again on Monday. We'll do sort of a, a little review um, to help get everybody all on the same page. Okay, so uh, today's topic is now about stars. Remember, we're going big to small. So we started with the universe, then we did galaxies, and now we're going to talk about stars. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about with stars are their properties. Um, stars get classified by three things, um, and that's their temperature, their composition, and their brightness. <clears throat> the temperature of a star is related to its color. Um, so for example, if you look at the picture down here at the bottom, uh, the sun, as I'm sure you know, is a yellow star. So it's kind of in the middle of the range. And you can see the temperatures that it responds or corresponds to. Um, and these temperatures are in degrees Kelvin because the numbers are pretty big. So we use Kelvin to talk about stars. Um, so as you get closer to the redder end, the temperature decreases. As you get closer to the bluer end, the temperature increases. So it's <clears throat> sort of the opposite color of what we think of with water, at least. Usually we think, you know, with our faucets, red is hot and blue is cold, um, but that's not the case with stars. Uh, so again, temperature gives the, or is determined by color. So um, when you look at a star, it could be any one of the colors that you're seeing in the picture. Okay, the next uh, property that we use to classify stars is based on their composition. And um, all stars are made of mostly hydrogen and helium. We talked a little bit about that when we were talking about the Big Bang. Um, and then they have a small percentage of heavier elements. <clears throat> Okay, um, and the way that we really figure out what the stars are made of, if you remember from just a few days ago, is by studying their spectra. Remember, you compare the spectra of the star to the spectra of known elements and see how they match. Um, so this is how we know what these stars are made of, even though we can't travel to them okay, or collect samples from it. Okay, and then the third piece that goes along with um, the classification system for stars is something that <clears throat> seems pretty obvious but can be a little bit complicated and that is brightness. There are actually three different ways to describe or measure a star's brightness. So we're going to take them kind of one at a time. Um, the first one here is called apparent magnitude. Um, and that's how bright a star looks basically from Earth without a telescope, without any sort of binoculars, any sort of device, just you looking into the nighttime sky and kind of noticing that there are some stars that are brighter than others. Um, and this was created, you could see, a really long time ago in 129 BC um, by a Greek astronomer. <clears throat> so... They were really, uh, the system was around for quite a long time. Um, we still use it today, but not quite as frequently as some of the other ones we're going to talk about. Um, the other thing I want you to take notice of, um, the scale for absolute, or for, excuse me, apparent magnitude, hey, is sort of backwards. Um, the brightest stars in the sky will be negative, and the dimmest objects in the sky will be positive. So just kind of notice on the picture down here that the scale is sort of flipped. Okay, that's important to keep in mind. Okay, the other two are used a bit more often now, now that we have better technology and a better way of measuring stars. So um, absolute magnitude is, I would say, probably the one of the most common ways to uh, talk about stellar brightness. Um, and that's how it would look it says from a standard distance from Earth. So what that essentially means is if you could take all the stars in the nighttime sky, put them side by side, how would they compare? Which one's actually brighter? Which one's actually dimmer? Now, since you can't do that, since you can't move the stars and line them all up and really kind of compare them, we do that mathematically. 
Um, then the, the scale for absolute magnitude is the same as a parent magnitude. Um, again, we have the lower numbers will be the brighter stars. So the brightest object in the sky is, of course, the sun. So that will have the lowest number because it is the brightest object. Okay, and then the final way that we measure stellar brightness is called luminosity. Um, and that depends on two factors, the size of the star and the temperature of the star. So typically, a star that is bigger is going to be more luminous, and a star that has a higher temperature will also be more luminous. Um, and kind of comparing the two factors, size is a bit more important than temperature. So if you're looking for a star that has a high luminosity, it would be like a blue hypergiant. <clears throat> Okay, or on the opposite end of the spectrum, it would be like a red dwarf would be one of the dimmest stars as far as luminosity goes. Okay, so again, we use apparent magnitude, absolute magnitude, and luminosity. And the one that you're going to see most of for our class is going to be absolute magnitude. So you might want to put a little extra star or highlight that um, because that's the one that we're going to focus the most on. Okay, now once we've gathered all of this information about stars, whatever stars you're studying, we take that information and like any good scientist, we graph it. Okay? And they're plotted on a graph called the HR diagram. Um, and they're plotted based on their brightness and their temperature. Okay, And based on their position on the graph, that tells us what type of star they are. Um, and we're going to cover the star types on Monday, um, so more to come on, on that. Um, the piece for now is we want to just take a look at the HR diagram a little closer. Um, and the reason why it's called the HR diagram is because it's named for the scientists who were the first people to make the graph, um, and that's Hertz, Brung, and Russell. Um, so they spent their lives collecting data on thousands and thousands of stars. They graphed them and then they realized they kind of grouped together. And you can see that on the graph here. So when you take a look at this <clears throat> a particular graph, you can see we're using absolute magnitude for our brightness. And don't forget again, at the top negative because it's the brightest. Uh, down at the bottom is the biggest number. So the axis is somewhat backwards from what we typically think of um, for X and Y. Um, and then also notice where zero is. It's not at the bottom. All right, so this is this is why sometimes it can be a little tricky. Um, and then down at the bottom where it says spectral type, that goes with the temperature. And again, the, temper the color goes with the temperature as well. So remember, over here on the blue side or the left-hand side, that would be the hottest stars in this blue band. And then all the way over here towards the right-hand side in the red color, those would be the coolest stars. Um, and I just want to point out that even though it uses the word cool here, um, that's a bit misleading because it's not cool by our standards. It's just a bit less hot than the others. It's still very, very hot. The temperatures are still very, very high. Um, so today you are going to be creating this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. We're going to be starting it today in class, and then we're going to be finishing it up on Monday. Most of the work for this is actually going to happen on Monday. So at this point, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you to kind of pause your videos for a few minutes uh, and I want you to gather up your materials for the HR diagram lab. Um, you should have a handout, you should have a graph paper, and you should have a ruler. Um, and I'm going to go over the directions. So again, pause the video, get yourself ready before you watch my directions. Okay, and we're back. Um, hopefully at this point you're looking at your handouts <clears throat> for the HR diagram. I have the same handout up on the screen in front of you. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through the basics. So today what you're really focusing on is basically step number one, step number two, and starting step number three. Um, you'll really get to the other three steps 
tomorrow or not tomorrow, but Monday. Um, and you'll be just really starting to plot for step number three. So the first thing you have to do is set up your graph. Um, notice in the directions, it tells you what to use for X and Y. Um, make sure that they're labeled. Uh, anytime you have a graph, you always want to label it, the X and the Y, and you want to have a title for the graph as well. So don't forget to title it. Um, remember for setting up your graph, it's going to be a little bit funky. A temperature is pretty standard um, as far as numbers go, but absolute magnitude, just remember, the more negative the number is, the brighter it is. Um, you also don't want to put zero um, right where X and Y converge, like on that, you know, lower left-hand corner. Um, zero should be a little bit higher up on the Y axis, just like you saw <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the notes. So you can always go back to the notes picture to kind of help guide you. Yours is not going to look exactly like the notes, but it can at least give you a good place to start. Um, if you're a little rusty on graphing, in the front of your note packet, there is a study skills or science skills sheet about graphing um, and you can go back and take a look at that if you're a little shaky on your graphing skills so take a look at that before you get started so essentially once you have your x and y axis set up again absolute magnitude and temperature <clears throat> then you're going to graph about 35 different stars which you can see on the data table and you are welcome to write all over this if you want to cross them out as you plot them okay so you'll find the magnitude you'll find the temperature and put your dot for your star where it's located you do not need to label all of the stars okay um you don't need to label them all there are a few that you need to label and you should reference the directions to find out which ones those are um you will probably not have time to do this entire plotting today and that's perfectly fine so take your time okay be thorough with it <clears throat> make sure that you use a pencil Okay, you're more than welcome to talk it over with your group members and help each other out as you're getting started Okay, and just get as far as you can with your plotting of your stars. Um, on Monday, when I'm back, um, you're going to have almost the whole class period to work on this because there's you can see some conclusion questions and whatnot. Um, and we will also kind of regroup to talk a little bit about more about the types of stars, which you will eventually include on your HR diagram. Hey, if you have any questions, make sure that you ask the sub or you can send me an email. Um, again, I'll be back on Monday and and uh, we'll make sure we get everybody all situated. And if you have questions about stars or galaxies, we'll do a little, you know, kind of question and answer session where you can ask me anything that you need. All right, guys, I hope you have a great day. Thanks again. And I'll see you on Monday.